Good evening. It, it is a pleasure to be with you tonight. Really appreciate the opportunity. Want to say thank you so much to the elders, to the mission committee, to everyone else that uh, was willing to allow me to come up and, uh, and share with you about Southern Africa Bible College. Now, one of the things I like to do when I start out is ask this question. How many of you, other than this morning, have heard of Southern Africa Bible College? Okay, great. I'm in a great place then. I got an opportunity to tell the full story to some people that have never heard it before. And I hope from this day forward, if you ever have that question asked again, you'll be like, oh yeah, I've heard of that. That's a great work in South Africa. It's in Benoni, South Africa. So let me play a little trivia with you. How many of you have heard of the name Benoni before? Okay, I see a lot of hands raised. Well, more hands than I heard about Southern Africa Bible College. And there's a reason for that. You see, the name Benoni is in your Bibles. It's the name of a person. His father named him Benjamin, the son of my right hand. Right? What a great name. But his mother, who died in childbirth, named him Benoni, son of my sorrow. That's the name of a town. Sorrowful. Can you believe that? Chamber of Commerce did not name that place, did it? Right? I mean, so the school is located in Benoni, South Africa. Now, what I want to do tonight is I want to share a little bit of the history, just a little bit. And then I want to tell you the four reasons that my wife and I got involved with this work. And then I want to come back and, and bring it back to us. Because it's easy to talk about something that's 10,000 miles away. It's a little more difficult to look at ourselves after looking at some scripture, right? So let's start out with the history and we'll be as brief as we can. So the school was started in 1966 by Eldred Eccles, a gentleman from Fort Worth, and Al Horn, a South African convert. Uh, they started in, uh, in 1966 with five students meeting under this tree. This is a chestnut tree that's still on campus today. So they called the school uh, to go back to what, uh, what Spencer was talking about early, they called the school at the time Southern Africa Bible College, not South Africa Bible College or school, because they had a big vision. They had a big vision that they were going to reach all of Southern Africa with the gospel. Well, you flash forward 51 years, and we've had over 1,500 attendees from 30 countries around the world who are now preaching, teaching, evangelizing and leading in over 50 countries around the world. You see, even their vision that they thought was so big at the time with five students meeting under a tree, it was too small. It was not as big as what God had in store for them. Well, today we have a 22-acre campus. Sorry, I pushed that twice. We had a 22-acre campus. This is the main building on campus. The middle facility is a, a large basketball-sized uh, room. It has a cafeteria and an uh, open multi-purpose-use place and uh, has offices. The dorm on the left is uh, for men, and the dorm on the right is for women. You can't see it, but uh, to the right of that is a library that was built in 2000 to go along with our accreditation. So in 2000, we got accredited to offer a bachelor's degree in theology. So we're an accredited school that, that uh, offers a degree that you can go anywhere else and, and continue your studies as well. Got to tell you, though, when I was first told about this work, I didn't hear about it until seven years ago. I was like, nah, I'm not really interested. Had a guy, one of my former students as a youth minister, and he came to me, he's a youth minister now, and he said, you know, you need to look into this work. I said, oh, I'm not really interested. But he told me more about it, and I was like, okay, I'll check it out. So my wife and I were going to go take a visit. We'd never been to South Africa before, never met anyone but Al Horn from South Africa. But as we started talking about this work, South Africans started coming out of the woodwork. When we moved from Austin to Houston, our real estate agent, who we called his name off a sign, was from Johannesburg, South Africa. I thought, wow, that's a coincidence. I went to lunch with a preacher in San Antonio, he took me to a restaurant owned by people from Benoni, South Africa. I thought, that's crazy. And I got a little excited. I said, why? You're from South Africa? We're going to South Africa. They got excited too. Wow, you're going to South Africa. Where are you going to go? 
I said, man, we're going to Benoni. It was there the conversation took a turn. <laughs> because in both cases, they had the same response. They said, ugh. I said, really? Ugh. They said, I hope you go somewhere nice while you're there. I thought, what have I gotten myself into? I'm taking my wife 10,000 miles from home to a place I've never heard of, never been to. It's called Sorrowful. What are we going to do there? What's going to happen? Well, after spending three weeks on campus with the staff, students, alumni, it made me think of a verse. John chapter 1, verse 43. Philip comes to Nathaniel. He says, Nathaniel, you're not going to believe it. We have found the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. This is the culmination of everything we know. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And their response, Nathaniel's response, Ugh. can anything good come out of Nazareth? What did he know about Nazareth? At the time, it was probably a city of 400 people. One very big, one very nice, one very fancy. It wasn't Bethsaida, the area where he was from. It wasn't Jerusalem, the holy city. It was just insignificant, unimportant Nazareth. What he didn't know, though, is that he served a God who from this insignificant, unimportant place could raise up salvation for the world. He could bring the Prince of Peace and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords from Nazareth. What do those people know about Benoni? It's a suburb of Johannesburg. It's 250,000 people. You're going to get out at the airport. It's a 20-minute drive right down a major expressway. You're going to pass the malls and uh, the McDonald's and two KFCs. I mean, it's a civilized country, right? <laughs> two KFCs. You're going to pass some golf courses, the brick and stucco houses. You might think you're even home. There's nothing fancy about it. It's not Cape Town. <laughs> Cape Town is gorgeous. It's beautiful, 3,000-foot cliffs overlooking the ocean. It's not Pretoria, the capital city, with this huge union building built on top of the hills overlooking these flower, uh, cultivated flower gardens. It's just insignificant, unimportant Benoni. What those people didn't know is that from a place called Sorrowful, God could raise up preachers, teachers, evangelists, and church leaders, take the gospel places you and I have never thought of going, never dreamed of going, and they changed the world. So this uh, evening, I ask you to come and see a little bit about Southern Africa Bible College. We got involved with this for four reasons. One, we got involved with it because of the students. Two, the leadership. Three, the return on investment. And four, the local support. And we'll try to go through these pretty quick. Uh, so we can be done on time, right? So, oh, go back. Go back. Can you go back? <laughs> Leave it up to hear the man. Corey was right. David is awesome. <laughs> That's great. So uh, the number one reason that I got involved is because of the students. To be a student at Southern Africa Bible College, or SABS, we call it for short, uh, you have to be recommended by your home congregation. You can't just show up and say, hey, I want an education. Your congregation has to say, here is someone with a heart for God, a desire to serve, and lots of potential. Then we can spend some money on them. Then we can educate them. So uh, some of our students' average age is probably about 30 to 35. We have some 18, 19-year-olds right out of high school. And then we have some uh, 40, 50-year-olds that have careers and said, hey, wait a minute. The church's work that I'm doing is more important than what I'm doing in my career. I want to give that up. I want to go back to school. So let me introduce you to one of our students. His name is Tabo. Tabo came to school at 50. Uh, he came with his son, who was, uh, I think, 19 years old and married. And he started at the same time his dad did. And Tabo has an upholstery business back in the hometown that he's from. And I'll just let you hear what Tabo has to say. Thank you. 
comes to uh, the work of God, is to make sure that I take as many souls as I can without getting lost together to the kingdom of God. So, you know, as I said, after starting the search, I want to be a full-time missionary. But uh, I'm going to start from a community where I see that this is potential for people to get this opportunity of getting uh, salvation. So I have to work out in my community uh, through this consensus. I have to make sense in order to find out the number of people in my community, the dimension of the area, and only to find that there is some issue of Christ throughout the entire nearby villages. They are plus or minus 100 villages which are plus or minus 50 kilometers from where I stay. So my plan is to make sure that in my area I'm sending people to work with me in order to bring these people to God. I want to make sure that in the period of two to three years, all the nearby communities must be able to serve. And that is what is saying in my heart. That's what I desire to do. So wait a minute, Tabo. You're working in upholstery business. You're raising three kids, but you're going to stop that for three years so you can go to school six hours away, only to move back to that area, continue in your upholstery business, and equip other people and reach out into this 30-mile area. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. What impresses us about the students at SABS is there are people that when they see a need, they are the ones that, say, that stand up and say, here am I, send me. He didn't say, man, I wish those Americans would send some more missionaries over here so they could do this and teach them. He didn't say, man, I wish, I wish Sabs would send somebody else out here. He said, this is on my heart. This is what I want to do. And he sacrifices and he's dedicated to ensuring that that takes place. Let me also let you hear from Tangani. Tangani is a little bit younger, but it's a very similar story. So again, we have a guy who worked in a city of 4 million people. He's living in the city. He said, hey, wait a minute. I don't need to get out of this rat race. I want to get back out to the country where I'm from. I'm going to have my chicken business. I was talking to him about his chicken business. I said, so tell me about your business. He said, well, I've got about five chicken houses. I said, oh, okay, that's great. How many does each hold? He said, oh, about 6,000 chickens each. I said, wait a minute. You're giving up income from a business that has 30,000 chickens for three years so you can learn, you can be equipped to evangelize? Yeah. And notice what he said and something else that Tabo said. They're not just working with one congregation. He's going to be evangelizing in the surrounding area also. He's going to be working with a bunch of churches. He's going to be trying to, to build up the, the churches in that area. He sees this as something that has utmost importance. And so he's willing to sacrifice 
these are just random students that I grabbed. We can go through uh, 48 of these if you like. I'll have to go back and video some more. But we have 48 students. That's why we love the students. That's the number one reason we're involved with this work. The second reason we're involved with this work is because of the leadership. Al Horn is the co-founder of the school, still serves as our president. Al Horn is incredibly evangelistic. He is nonstop evangelism. He just turned 80 this year, but it, it's, he still preaches for the Benoni Church. He still has personal Bible studies in his home and, and married couples coming over for small groups and all this kind of stuff. He stays busy, and he's very evangelistic. And that evangelism, evangelistic attitude has permeated throughout the school for years. But another thing that Al did that is so good is he found the next generation and the next generation of leadership. In 2000, he turned the leadership over to the gentleman on your left there. Fred Berg. Fred Berg is a South African, became a Christian in 1969. He was studying uh, law and foreign affairs at university. He had a long career with the South African government. When Mandela got out of prison, it was Fred's job to take care of any legal need that Mandela had. When Mandela became president, he appointed Fred to be South Africa's ambassador to the United Nations, where he served six years in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, negotiating all kinds of treaties that are still important to us today like the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons agreement. He gave that up in 2000 to take over running the school. And I won't tell you the story of this tonight, but if you go to our website, you can watch a video that uh, speech he gave in Dallas not too long ago of why he did that. Suffice it to say, he looked around and he said, you know, there is nothing more important than the Great Commission. And he took early retirement and took over running the school. But I want you to hear from one of our other uh, leaders, Hubert Ramagwedi. Hubert is a chemist by trade in South Africa, um, but uh, he left his job with a, a chemical company, uh, no, platinum company, just a few years ago to start his own business. This is a busy man. But he devotes one day a week to the school. And I thought, why, Hubert, are you giving so much time to the school? And this is what he said. So when he says that he's seen a difference, uh, Hubert's dad and some of the faculty members from the college back in the late 60s started a congregation up in the northeastern part of South Africa that today is a thousand member congregation. It's completely self-supporting and it has a training program for its members. And if a member does well in their training program, they send them to SABS for three years. And after that time, they go back, they set them up with a secular job in an area that doesn't have a church of Christ and they plant one. And today there are over 60 churches of Christ in that area using that method. He has seen the difference. He's also an elder for the Meadowlands Church of Christ in Soweto, which was a couple of years ago was a 250-member congregation. They hired two of our graduates uh, that between them could speak seven of the 11 official languages in South Africa. So they could reach out to a broad group of people. Today that congregation is a 350-member congregation and has planted another congregation nearby that started out in January with about 50 members. He has seen the difference, so he dedicates his time to it. 
The third reason we're involved with the school is because of the return on investment. I'm not the best at saying this, so I'll let Trude Adair of Sunset International Bible Institute say it. He says, on the average, it costs $50,000 to send an American mission family somewhere in the world. So let's say we send five mission families somewhere in the world, that's $250,000, and they will stay five, 10, 15 years. They'll, they'll do good work. They'll start churches. They'll start schools. They'll help the needy. They'll, they will be representatives of Christ. But in a world of 7 billion people, we can quickly see we don't have the resources to reach it that way. We have got to find ways to supplement that. And training and equipping Christians on the field has proved effective and cost-effective uh, for many years. So at SABS, the single, uh, cost of a single student is $8,400 per year. It's kind of expensive, really, when you think about a mission field, but the cost of living in South Africa is pretty high. It's also less than what, uh, what we pay here in the States, right? Uh, but 3,600 of that is room and board, 4,800 a, a year is tuition. But you can, oh gee, you compare that to $50,000 a year for an American mission family. So if we invest $24,000 in a student over three years, at the end of that three years, we have someone who knows the local languages and customs, who grew up in that area, who has been recommended by their home congregation as someone who has a heart for God and a desire to serve. They have sat at the feet of people who have planted and grown churches in that area for years. And they go back to their hometown and country, and they will be there a lifetime, supported by their own work and the local church. We think that's a pretty good return on investment of $24,000, to have a lifetime missionary in an area. The fourth reason we're involved is because of the local support. And really, this was the kicker. I was still kind of, eh, no, no, I'm still not into it. In 2010, South African churches gave 364,000 rand a year to the school. That was 30% of our budget. In the last seven years, with an economy that has 40% unemployment, South African Christians have given 657,000 rand this last year. They have increased what they give. The South African Christians are saying, this is how we're going to reach our part of the world for Christ. This is not Americans sending American people and American money going over there, say, y'all don't worry your pretty little heads about it, we'll take care of it for you, right? This is us partnering with the Christians on the field that see the effectiveness saying, we want to work with you. We want to partner with you. And they are stepping up to the plate and increasing their giving as well. Benoni Church of Christ is the second largest supporting congregation at $1,500 a month. So, <clears throat> let me let the students and some of the leadership tell you thank you. One of our female students that was converted not too long ago, converted by the faculty members, her name was Amanda. In her video, she said, you know, I've got to thank the people that started all this. Because if you didn't start this, I wouldn't know what the gospel is. I wouldn't be saved. I hope you hear that from all of your mission points. The difference you're making in people's lives is immeasurable. You're making eternal differences. But let me let you hear from them.
I really like that last line because the leadership is saying, look, we've had 50 years, 1,500 graduates, 50 countries around the world. That's nothing compared to what we're going to do in the future. They're not sitting back saying, all right, look at what we've accomplished. They're planning and making uh, goals for the future. And I think in South Africa with apartheid gone, the second and third generation of leadership, the accredited status that we have, there is no holding this school back. So thank you for your partnership in this effort, for your partnership in this work. I would love to, to answer any questions you have. I've got a display back in the back. What can you do? You're helping with student scholarships already. We'd appreciate you to continue to do that. Pray for the staff, students, and alumni. I have a list back there on the back that you can sign up for your email address and your mailing address. We send one quarterly email newsletter and it's typically a video, like you've seen tonight, of a student. We'd love for you to sign up and receive that. We send one mailed newsletter a year. We're not going to inundate your mailbox, is what I'm saying. But hopefully it will give you some information to pray about, and you'll know what's going on in school. Third, uh, introduce us to other congregations or individuals that you know that might be interested in this work. We'd be happy to make that connection. And then fourth, work with us in South Africa. You want to go to South Africa, you want to do some work with the students and some of their, their ministries that are started around the school, uh, we'd love to help coordinate that. Go down to Cape Town, see Ben and see the work that he's doing down there or uh, some of the other alumni down there, we'd love to, to help coordinate that with you. So if you go, we'll introduce you to some of the locals. You'll get to have a braai. That's not a barbecue, it's a braai, but it's excellent stuff. And... Uh, some of the other people introduce you to the wildlife. My wife you can meet here in the States. The uh, cheetah you'll have to go over there to see. And then um, that's some of the other people. I almost ran into that elephant when I was driving down the road in the park. I didn't see it, oddly enough. I don't know why my, I don't know why my wife's worried about my driving, but uh, we would love to have your partnership in this effort. Now, like I said, it's easy to talk about something that's 10,000 miles away. But if we logically believe that God can raise up salvation from insignificant, unimportant Nazareth, and he can bring preachers, teachers, evangelists, and church leaders out of a place called Sorrowful, some insignificant place in Africa, we have got to logically believe that he can use you and me to do incredible things in this community, to change the people around us, to bring hope and salvation to the world around us, no matter what our age our status in life, God can use you. Not because you're so special, but because it's Him working through you. Would you ever look at the stars at the sky and go, eh, pff, that's nothing. I could have done that. That'd just be a weekend's worth of work for me, right? No. You wouldn't because it's His workmanship. I'll tell you what, Paul says, you are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. May God bless you as you not only support mission efforts financially and with your words and with your prayers, but as you do missions in your community. You see, Tabo had something very interesting to say. He said, I want to start in the area that has the least potential to hear uh, of getting salvation, right? You remember that line? You know where the least potential, the area of least potential for someone to hear the gospel is? If you're not telling somebody about the gospel, it's your area. Let's start there. If you have any needs tonight, won't you come as we stand and sing this song?